I'm so excited to be here at Relentless with my Relentless family. I love y'all so much. So good to see your faces. Can we do this? Can we give a thunderous shout for our pastors, Pastor John and Pastor Avatar Gray? Oh, our God is so good. I said our God is so good. He does miracles so great. God does miracles. Tap three people and say, God does miracles so great. So great. When he does it, he does it good. If you're looking for a miracle, I know the man who can do it. Glory to God. Can we still, where's my baby? Oh, can we give it up for my husband, Pastor Kenneth Leonard Jr. I love you, baby. My family is here, my mom, my baby boy. The purpose place is in the room. Every leader, every pastor, thank you so much for this opportunity uh, to stand around the word of God. And I'm not gonna prolong the time. I believe there's a word from the Lord and I'm so excited about it. Um, so excited about it. Are y'all excited about the word? Yeah. Amen. So I'm gonna go to the word, I'm gonna go straight in. I ain't gonna sing no song tonight. Can we give up for the worship team? I love the worship. Love the worship. Thank you for your persistence and your consistency in taking us into the presence of the Lord. We're going to Genesis, the 22nd chapter. Um, I'm sorry to the media team. The Lord changed my message. So I sent y'all the wrong stuff. Okay. Yeah, I know any communicators in the room, you want to you want to get that message. That's just, you know, you think it's the one going to shout to people and not. And God was like, you want to say what you want to say? Or do you want to say what I want to say? So he changed my message tonight. We're going to go with the flow. So we're going to Genesis 22, 1 through 14. We're going to read a little bit. We're going to read a little bit. If we're going to stand, we're going to stand. If we, what are we going to do, y'all? We're going to stand up. We're going to sit down. All right, we're going to stand up. <laughs> They was like, we're going to stand up for the word of God. <laughs> All right, let's stand. We're going to read it together. I'm reading from the NIV. And it says, sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded a donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife as the two of them went on together. The seventh verse says, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, finally, y'all, I'm like, what? He said, Father, he says, yes, my son. Abraham replied, I see the fire and I see the wood, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? The eighth verse says, Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. The ninth verse says, when they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on an altar and on top of the wood. Then he reached out his head and took a knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy. Don't do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. The 13th verse says we're almost there, y'all. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place 
the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said on the mountain, the Lord will provide. Somebody scream, Jaira. I said, scream, Jaira. All right, now y'all can sit down. I don't know. How many of y'all follow me on Instagram? Oh, I got good weight up in here. If you don't follow me, you're missing out on a good time, all right? So a, few, a while ago, I reposted a reel that it highlighted a bit of my basketball skills. I know this is a sore spot, uh, relentless. <laughs> I just, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. <laughs> We're not talking about that one other. I highlighted a little bit of my basketball skills. Now, don't let the nails, the bundles, and the makeup fool you. PT has a mean jumper. One thing you should know about me is that I don't lose. Notice I didn't say I don't like to lose. I don't lose. And we joke about this, I know we laugh about it, this is, but, but here's a serious sidebar, and I want to expose one of the enemy's tricks. The enemy wants to keep us focused on the fact that God has won the war. He wants us to only have that when we make it in mentality. That when we all get to heaven, that someday soon and very soon uh, 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 mentality. The enemy's desire is to keep us focused on the end goal. But God's desire is not that we only win the war, but he also has given us victory in the battles. I need about 50 people and we're going to rock tonight. He wants us to win the battle. Somebody scream, I got mumba mentality. Where my basketball folk at in the room? Y'all know what mumba, yeah. Mumba mentality means I'm facing every battle with confidence, passion, and purpose. I got Bible for you. The, Bi the Bible says the thief does not come except to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Wait, come on, word. I have come that they might have life and that they may have it. How much? More? I got some more. 2 Corinthians 2 and 14 says, but thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph. I don't need but 50 people. Causes us to triumph. Somebody scream, God wants me to win. Not just when I get to heaven, but right here on earth. My husband, who's back there on the keys, he don't lose either. But he got this thing, y'all, where he used to go around, be, and he would say stuff like, if I played Michael Jackson, right, Michael Jordan, I beat him today. <laughs> now, for all my married folk in the room, all the ladies, I got to go with him. <laughs> you know? And so, so in the presence of other people, I'd be like, you know, I ain't never seen him lose. You know, that's the, <laughs> that's our support, but. So I'd be like, no, I ain't never seen him lose. So one time he, he was around a group of men. I, I could beat you, I could beat you, I could beat you. I beat Jordan right now. And we got home, I was like, babe. <laughs> nah, we in this thing together, but you keep putting us in the water. <laughs> he responded to me and said, why would I play the game if I'm expecting to lose. Why you jump out there and get that job if you don't want to win at it? Why you start that business if you don't want to win at it? Why you got that career if you don't want to win at it? It is God's design and desire that I win. Somebody scream, God wants me to win. I'm not going to jump out there in the water if I don't expect to walk. All right, let me get back to my story. Get back to my story. So Pastor Tasha was a baller, as re was revealed on my Instagram. Follow me. <laughs> as I was meditating on this message, Holy Spirit took me back to the good old days in Wayne County High School, the hometown of Jesse, Georgia. I can, I can recall several instances where we would, we would be having what most would call a good game. I hear my husband say that all the time. Man, it's a good game. When he's talking about the games, it's like one or two points. You know, you know those games where one mistake could cost you the game? Those games that keep everyone standing on the edge of their seats the whole time? It's the games, those games that they're they only good games if you ain't playing in it. 
I can think of several more befitting terms for them kind of games. How about stressful game, high blood pressure game, sickening game. I'm over this game. Anyway, Holy Spirit took me back to memories of some of those good games. Those games have a lot of noise. Everybody is making noise. Your supporters are making noise. Your haters are making noise. The coaches are making noise. The referees are making noise. Everybody has an opinion. Shoot the ball, pass the ball, hold the ball, stall the ball, press, foul them. <laughs> it never fails that in the heat of the moment, there has to be a foul. Either your team is up or your team is down. And if you're the one at the free throw line in the midst of all of the noise, the bleachers are sounding like thunder. The fans are at war. Somewhere deep in the distance, you can hear these words ring out from your coach. Get your head in the game. I came to tell somebody up in Relentless, get your head in the game. And suddenly, you take a deep breath. You remind yourself of the technique necessary to make this shot. The follow through that is necessary to make this shot. And most importantly, that you have the skill, the talent, and the ability, and the equipment to win. Holy Spirit began to share with me that many of us are in the hot seat right now. The ball is in your hand, but there is a lot of noise. Noise from the enemy trying to distract your focus, telling you that maybe you made the wrong decision and maybe you're on the wrong team, telling you that you should give up because it's too much pressure. Telling you that it's safer to forfeit, to throw in the towel and to give up. This is a different perspective, but sometimes the distracting noise can be coming from our supporters. Coming to you with all them maybes. Well, maybe you should sit this one out. Take a sabbatical. Focus your energy on something else. Maybe you need to let your hair down. Get you a few drinks. Puff, puff, give, you know. It's all natural. Coming to you with all the maybes. You're so uptight all the time. Maybe you need to get you some. Relieve the stress. Coming at me with all the maybes. You just don't have the capacity right now. They'll understand. Maybe you need to sit this season out. God knows your heart. Somebody look at your neighbor and tell them, get your head in the game. That was the wrong neighbor. I need you to look at somebody else and tell them, get your head in the game. I need you to silence all that noise. I need you to, de dis I need you to deactivate every distraction and get your head back in the game. I don't know who this is for, but I heard God say, winning that argument is not worth losing. Because when you miss the shot, the whole team suffers a loss. When you miss the shot, your family suffers, your marriage suffers, your children suffers, your team suffers, your church suffers. You can call me Coach T tonight because I came to tell you, get your head. In the game. I know there's a lot of noise. But dig deep and hear that still small voice saying, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end, it shall speak and not lie. I, I, I need you to hear that still small voice saying, and let us not become weary in well-doing. For when y'all in do, what's going to happen? You shall reap. If you faint not, let's get into our text. Just one chapter prior, the Bible shares the story of the miraculous birth of Abraham and Sarah's promised son, Isaac. Can you imagine the faith boost they experienced to see the manifested miracle take place? The only thing they had to stand on was a promise. Have you ever been in a place where you know what God said? You know what God promised, but the, th the way things were set up, it just wasn't looking good. 
It literally seemed impossible. Abraham and Sarah were facing an impossible situa situation. She was too old. She was barren. And I hear some of y'all saying, PT, that's me right now. The exact same situation Abraham and, and Sarah were in, but, but God, Sarah was told, she was too old, she was barren, but God said, you're going to give birth. Can I take two seconds and prophesy to somebody, and I'm just looking for about 50 radical praisers who have received the word from the Lord, that God's about to give you a but God testimony. I know we hear that kind of talk in church all the time, and it feels like antics, but I need you to go past the clutter and hear what God is saying. You've been asking questions. What is this season about? Why is this looking like this? Why am I so agitated and aggravated? Why is everything getting on my nerves? I came to prophesy to you not to get weary in doing well because this season is about to usher you into a black God season. It was looking bad, but God, I didn't understand, but God, other people gonna look at your life and say, I know where she came. was fulfilled after years of waiting and faith. Let me encourage you today to not grow weary. Here we find Abraham some years later faced with another faith opportunity. Can we change our language right here when people start asking us, hey, when somebody asks you what's going on, you're like, oh, the bills are doing all of that, these kids. My spouse. Let, your, let our response be, I'm just facing a faith opportunity. I'm just, I'm just in the middle of a faith opportunity. In studying the life of Abraham, it is understandable why he is deemed the father of the faith. You will find no greater faith in scripture. Scholars argue that this incident takes place when Isaac was between the ages of 19 and 33. I got to take a second and dissect this, y'all. Because I be asking questions. So Isaac wasn't a newborn. Isaac was an infant. No, a toddler. I got a toddler. I can't even put Asher on a, on a chopping block and say, I'm about, to cut, I'm about to cut you up. Asher be in the room in 20 seconds. He wasn't a little boy. Isaac was a grown man. Again, this speaks volumes about Abraham's faith. Picture this. Abraham, two servants, and Isaac leave on a journey to a destination God told Abraham about. So here we witness again the depth of the relationship God and Abraham have. So much so that he starts the journey with full confidence that God will reveal the destination once he arrives. Some of us won't leave the house without the GPS. I mean, I'm not pulling out the driveway without an address. But God said, I'm going to show you when you get there. That's not even the most amazing part to me. The part that had me tripping, y'all, was that there were three grown men with him, fully aware that they were on their way to sacrifice without a sacrifice. 
This was a three-day journey. I can imagine the mental anguish of wondering, but wait a... They probably was looking at each other like, is it you? <laughs> For three days. But here's what blessed me. Abraham's faith was so proven that these men, men had faith in his faith. <laughs> Woo! I said they had faith in his faith. Do you have faith that has been so proven that when you step out on faith to do something wild, radical, and unthinkable, the people around you jump on board because your faith has never failed? Your relationship with Christ has been so proven. Abraham's faith was so certain that Isaac willfully carried the supplies that were intended for his death. Isaac basically said, this don't look good. I don't understand. But here's one thing I do know, that when daddy say, God say it. That's the wrong side. Isaac said, when daddy says that God said, his faith never fails. Daddy's God has never failed. I'm looking for some parents in this room and you've been praying for that child. You've been saying, God, you said over this child. Let me tell you this. They are looking at your life. If I can't get them to come in the house, they can look at my life. And when the rubber hits the road and stuff gets tough in their life, when I go to my child and say, well, God said you are an apostle, that you are a man of God, that you walk in authority because they've been watching my life, they're going to say, I don't know about God, but if mama said, I trust her God. <laughs> I, can, I can depend on her God. Let your faith be so sure that the people around you trust your faith. There's a promise that's been spoken over your life. A promise that's, that has been spoken over your family. And God is faithful and just to perform every word he has spoken. Don't give up on the promise. I got three points and we rolling out, y'all. So our daughter, Symphony. Y'all, Symphony, she like taller than me now. I know, ain't that too much? This is the way you got to knock them out at the knees. I was just playing. Um, Symphony just graduated elementary school, y'all, and she's going to middle school. And um, there was some testing that had to take place uh, before she was allowed to be promoted to the next level. In high school and college, these tests are called finals. Y'all remember finals? Yeah. It's just a mess. You know, I went back to school when I was 40. And I was like, you know what? My brain is not <laughs> equipped for this. Can we just give me a pass on life? Can I try to give some credits on life? <laughs> Finals are a compilation of questions that test you on all the information you've been studying throughout the year. The only way for the instructors or teachers to know if you're ready to pass is for them to test you. The first part of verse number one says, sometime later, God tested Abraham. Can I submit to you today this first point? This is only a test. I know we wanted something deeper. This is only a test. Who am I talking to? This is, this is only a test. Get your head in the game. You know what to do. The word of God has equipped you with all the tools you need to pass this test. This test gives you access to your next level of faith. We always talk about faith to faith and glory to glory. And we love to dwell on the faith part, but there's a middle piece called two. Two is uncomfortable. Two, two is a little foggy sometimes. Two sometimes come without explanation. Two sometimes make you just keep walking until God say, you, you here. 
Mm -mm. <laughs> Get your head in the game. Let me, let me give you some word for it because we might need some reminders. First Peter 5 and 7 says, this is what you do when you're taking a test. Cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. Isaiah 41 and 10 says, so, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Joshua 1, this is the word of God, y'all. Joshua 1 and 9 says, have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Psalms 91, I love this one. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. You are at the free throw line. You know exactly what to do. Don't choke. Look at the people up and down your row and say, don't choke. Don't. It's only a test. I feel you, and many of us are feeling like, but God, where are you? God, I can't hear you. Let me reassure you that he's still in the room. Yeah? He will never leave you nor forsake you. You might not hear him, but if you tap in, you can sense him. He's only quiet because you're taking a test. The fourth verse says, on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. I need somebody to shout, this is going somewhere. somewhere. Now say it till you believe it. This is going, this is going somewhere. So I'm a why kind of person. My team will tell you, I know it gets on their, on their nerves. I'm always going to ask why. Like, I, why? Why'd you say that? Why, why you text them instead of calling them? Why you took that no as an answer? Why? I, just, I need to know. Can we all be honest and say that there are seasons, some places and some things that God allows us to go through that makes us ask the question, why? Why is this necessary? Why me? Why now? What is the point? And my favorite is, what's happening? Here we have another example of faith demonstrated by Abraham. I love this faith. God tells him, get up and go to the region of Moriah, and I'll show you the place once you get there. Let's keep it all the way 100. This is disconcerting. It is a complicated thought because the majority of us want to have faith under control. Ooh. We got faith for the house after We've gotten the credit score. I heard you, man of God. You was, I was like, thank you, Lord. We want to have faith, faith for the house after we got the credit score right and after we saved up some stacks. But it's a complicated thought for us to believe that God will lead us to a bank that will offer a loan when I haven't gotten everything together already. So most times, many of us never get up and go because we are comfortable with having faith under control. We want to have faith for what we can see. Mm. We want to have faith for what is tangible. Faith under control. So most times, many of us, we never get up and go. But I need you to shout, this is going somewhere. And guess what? I know. I know that many of us have been scarred from putting your heart and trust in people who have failed you and it ended up going nowhere. But hear the word of the Lord today. Don't be afraid. Move when God says move. Don't be distracted by voices that are contradicting what God is saying. God has a destination and a plan in mind. He just needs your trust. Jeremiah 29 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. This is going somewhere. We don't know, but he knows. Sometimes we don't know, but we got to trust that he knows. I'm going to the 10th verse, and I'm getting out of the way. 10th verse says, then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am. Here. I love the way that he just be like, here I am. 
like, I need faith like this. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. The 13th verse says, Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as the burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. I'm always asking the the scriptures questions, y'all. I'd be like, now did that really have to, it didn't take all of that? My God. So I kept reading this scripture, growing more and more perplexed at how the outcome seemed a bit schizophrenic. It felt like a bit of a contradiction to me that God would give Abraham instruction to go sacrifice his son. But when it came down to the nitty gritty and the rubber hit the road, when the boy was on the chopping block and the knife was in the air, then suddenly there was an urgency. Like, what's the problem? I'm doing what you told me to do. The moment was so significant that he called Abraham's name twice. They teach us in Bible school that there is a great significance when God calls a name or a city twice. There are 10 documented times in scripture where this has happened and each instance is a record of immediate elevation. In each instance, what was about to happen and be shared was a momentous moment in biblical history. So I started asking God, well, what happened here? Did you change your mind? And if that's the case, then I got so many more questions. I asked, why did you ask him to sacrifice this boy? Then turn around and tell him not to lay a hand on him. Can I tell y'all what he told me? There wasn't enough people. (laughs) He said, the sacrifice of the boy was always about heart posture and obedience. I always knew there would be a ram in the bush. I'm about to get out your way because I missed a few people just then. But I need you to look at about three people and tell them this is the only way. No, no, I need you to tell them this is the only way. This is the only way. Listen to me right now. Hold on, baby. Abraham sacrificed Isaac when he took his first step towards the region of Moriah. Some of us have been in a place where it feels like we're losing the promise. It feels like we're losing that one thing that we have security about. It feels like we're losing something we cherish. It feels like we're losing that one thing that we had control over. It feels like we're losing our grip on our marriage, losing our grip on our career. It feels like we're losing our grip on our mental stability and our children. But God is saying, I did not come to take from you. I am here to provide for you. But God can't put anything in a hand that is already full. Oh, just this turn. God can't put anything in our hands when they are already full. Many of us in this room, we trust God with certain things. But then there are certain things that we want to hold on to and say, this is mine. But God is saying, I ain't trying to take them children from you. I'm trying to save their lives. But I can't do it if you got your hand on it. I know you feel like your financial situation is in a mess right now and you want to figure out maybe it's another loan, maybe it's another job, maybe if I go do this and do that, you have your hand on it. The sacrifice of the boy happened when he took his first step towards where God said to go. He wasn't here to take the boy. (laughs) He just wanted to see if there was obedience. I need you to trust me with the promise. I need you to prove to me that you will withhold nothing from me. 
This is the only way, y'all, to get to Jairo. The only way to get to full provision is to let it all go. Some of us been holding on. We've been, we, we literally, as sisters in the spirit, feel like we're losing our minds trying to figure it out. But because it feels like it's so many weights all at once. Yeah. And God is saying, I'm not here to take from you. I'm going to always provide. There will always, I hear this, y'all, be a ram in the bush. Take that weight off of your shoulder. There will always. You don't need a new job. You don't need another career. You don't even need more money. You don't need another loan. I hear him saying that this season is not a losing season. Woo! God is saying this is not a losing season. But this season is the only way to get you to the expected end. You are not losing your house. You are not losing your mind. You are not losing your peace or your focus or your joy or your children or your family. Jaira has always provided another way. God, woo, he will always provide another way. This season is about taking your hands off of it. Who am I talking to in this room? This season is about taking your hands off of it. It is about you giving up on trying to figure it out yourself. I'm talking to every control person in the room. I know because I'm one of them. I'm going to always try to figure out another way. But God will intentionally put us in situations that we can't figure out. And that's when you got to walk in the faith of Abraham that says, wherever you tell me to go, I'm going to take a step. And I'll figure it out once I get there. <laughs> God, just keep me at your feet so I know your voice. Had Abraham not known the voice of God, he would have slayed his son. The voice of God says, stop right there in your tracks. Don't you put a hand on this boy. But had he not been in the feet of Jesus, had he not been at the feet of God and known and been in relationship with him, he would have killed the promise. Some of us got our hands on it and we are about to kill the promise because we don't want to let it go. How do I save this marriage? By letting it go. Get to the feet of Jesus. Do your part. Take it out of your hands and watch God renew what he has promised. Society tells us that you demonstrate love by holding on. Me, my, this is me, myself, and I. This is mine's. mine's. But God's way tells us that you demonstrate love by letting go. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave. First John, John 3.16 says, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Ephesians 5 and 2 says, And walk in love, as Christ has loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering. Family, I need y'all to hear me clearly. You have been instructed to get up and go. Letting go is the only way to your next place of gyro. Come on, y'all stand up. It's a heart posture of sacrifice, a level of obedience that says this don't feel good, but I trust you. This doesn't look good, but what? But I trust you. This doesn't make sense to me, but I trust you. This is foggy and it's uncomfortable. It's breaking my heart and it's lonely, but I trust you. I wish I had something that was more soothing, more comforting, something that made you shout and celebrate, but God sent me to Relentless to tell you that this is the only way. Many of us have been looking for a way out, but God is saying the only way out of this is to tuck your head down, 
dig deep. Remember what you've been taught. Get your head back in the game and forge forward withholding nothing. You are standing at the free throw line. It's game point. Will you be distracted by all the noise? Or will you get your head in the game? I'm talking to some people tonight. And you, you said, man, I needed to hear this because I was two seconds from giving up on this. I was two seconds from throwing in the towel, but I needed the revelation that this was never mine in the first place. It all belongs to him. It is all for his glory. That business, that career, that marriage, those children, it is all for his glory. If I'm talking to you, I need you to just lift your hands where you are. This is a moment. I feel it in the room. I was going to say come to the altar, but I feel like we need to just stay where you are and lift your hands in this moment and tell him, God, I trust you. No, no, don't say it because I told you to. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Say it from your heart. God, I, I trust you. I know I've been a, a little off and I've been out of focus and I, I've been focusing on the wrong thing, thinking, thinking this was about me and it, it was about my strength. But I'm putting my focus back on your strength. That when I am weak, that's when your strength shows up with perfection. Come on, lift your hands and begin to worship him in this moment and say, I'm giving it all over to you. I'm giving it all over to you. I've been holding on to this, but I give it back to you. I give, you, I give it back to you because it is your desire that I would prosper. But I feel like there's been a wall in the way and I'm finding out right now that maybe it's been me. Mm -hmm. So Father, tonight we say thank you for your word. Thank you that there are reminders in your word that give us strength as we walk out this thing called life. There are reminders in your word that we have authority in the earth as we walk out life. God, we say that we love you and we trust you with all that we have. We trust you with every gift, every talent, every promise. Ooh. We trust you with our houses and our families and our relationships. And we say yes again. Come on, say yes again. I will be content in every circumstance. Chara, you are enough. And I will be content in every circumstance. Chara, come on. You are enough. Can we say that one more time? I will. I will be content in every circumstance. Chara, you are enough. The team is counting on you to make this shot. I will be content in every circumstance. Chira, you are enough. You're forever enough, more than enough. Come on, raise it up. Forever enough. Always enough. More than enough. Come on, y'all got a louder one for real. You're more than enough, forever enough, always enough, more than enough. Gyra, Gyra, you are enough. Gyra, Gyra, you are enough. There's some people in this room. And if we be honest, you've been saying this whole time, well, man, I hear about the faith of Abraham and I wish I had relationship with like that. But some of us, if we be honest, we walked away. 
Some of us, this, this message tonight, it wasn't to save us from walking away. It was to restore us. Some of us who have already walked away. And guess what? He's still standing right there with his arms wide open saying, I still have Jaira for you. Just come running back to me. This altar is open. If you've been saying, man, I wish I had the faith like Abraham. I wish I had the relationship like Abraham. This is your moment. And you may be asking, well, do I got to walk out of my seat? Do I have to walk out? Let me tell you something. Walking from your seat, that is symbolic. It's a prophetic gesture of you saying, I'm leaving the old. I'm leaving where I was. And I'm coming back. I'm coming to where God wants me to be. I need you to get out of your seat right now. If you're in this room and you're saying, I need to restore this relationship. I need to come back to Jesus. with your mouth and believe in your with your heart the Lord Jesus then you're saved there are so many benefits that comes with partnership do we have any investors in the room that whatever you invest in when it blow up you get a piece of that partnering with Jesus Christ relationship with Jesus Christ we get we get a piece of that so if he has authority in the earth then I have authority in the earth if there's authority in his voice when he speaks and atmospheres have to respond, then I have authority when I speak and atmospheres have to respond. Your walk tonight, it'll change your life forever. Can we celebrate that, that your life, this is the best decision you have ever made. So lift your hands real high, throw them up real high. This is a sign of surrender that I'm taking my hands off of everything I've been trying to co control and I'm giving it back to you. Woo! That's all over this room. Throw your hands up high and say, I'm taking my hands off and I'm giving it back to you. Repeat this after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I love you. I'm running back to you with my heart wide open and I confess that you are the Lord Jesus Christ, that you died for my sins and that you rose on the third day. And tonight, I denounce the plans of the enemy over my life. And I declare 
that I am saved in Jesus' name. Somebody celebrate. Come on, celebrate. I know we got to go, y'all, but I just sense this in the room. There are gifts that come with salvation. One of them is called the Holy Spirit. It gives you authority to speak to those
Y'all can keep praising, but I'm gonna get off the stage. Oh, I'm not doing no benediction. I'm Now, there's really only one thing we got left to do. There's two, but we gotta take care of one. We have to sow into this word. This is not an option. Paul said in Philippians, there was one church, one, that partnered with me in giving and receiving. Did you receive tonight? Come on, somebody. You can never complain about what you permit. The honor of this word is worthy of a seed. So we're going to take a second to sow into this word. We're going to partner with receiving by giving. So I don't want to hamper the moment, but we must honor the moment with the seed. It's biblical. So you, there's no pressure, there's no obligation. We want to honor, which is a choice, the word that was sown into us tonight. So if you need an envelope for your giving, please raise your hand. We want to get that to you. We want to do this as a seed of honor for the word that was sown. Just throw it up. Our ushers will love to serve you. The Bible says we ought to honor the word with the seed. Paul said one church. If there's one church in Greenville, South Carolina, it will be relentless church that will honor the word with the seed. So as you prepare, you can bring that up. There's baskets at the stage. If you need an envelope, do that. I'm going to pray. You can also text to give or give through the app as well. Did y'all, wasn't that a powerful word? Come on. The son was sacrificed when he took the first step. My God. Let's honor this moment with the seed. I'm going to pray for you. My God, you can feel God in here. He's here. Anyone else really quick, I want to make sure we're respectful of your honor by giving into this word. So I'm going to pray for us and release us. But can we just give honor one more time to Pastor Tasha and Kenny and her, and her family? Thank you so much for sowing that word into this body, the part of the body. We honor you and thank you. We got a few more people still giving. Hey, let me pray for you. Father, I thank you so much for your people. Number one, I pray that this word that was sown was sown in good ground, that it will produce 30, 60, and 100 fold. Any attempt from the enemy to get the seed of this word, I rebuke right now in Jesus' name, because we know he comes immediately. So Holy Spirit, seal this thing. Be with your people. Bless them. May everything they put their hands to prosper. Prosper them in mind, in body, and in spirit. I pray all these things in Jesus' mighty name. If you agree, church, say amen. My God, thank y'all so much for coming out to Pursuit Night. Uh, I know our pastors are blessed to have you. Be safe going home, and we will see you Sunday, 8, 15 a.m. God bless you guys, and good night.